muted. Good morning. I'm Michelle Lavander, Editor of Reporting on Health. We're going to be speaking today about what soaring drug prices mean for patients. There's no question that drug prices are rising exponentially, but is this simply the price of innovation or is the U.S. healthcare system set up in a way that allows prices to get out of control? And is that even the right question to ask, or should we be focusing solely on access to these drugs? We have a distinguished panel who will explore these issues with us. Molly Ann Brody, who leads the Kaiser Family Foundation's Public Opinion Survey Program, will discuss her polling results, which show Americans' complex views on pricey drugs. They value them and need them, but largely mistrust the drug companies. Dr. Peter Bach, a practicing oncologist, essayist, and director of Memorial Sloan Kettering's Center for Health Policy and Outcomes, will share his insights into the causes of pricey care, as well as some unique ways that his cancer center has challenged pricing practices. And health journalist Kristen Gourlay of Rhode Island Public Radio challenges us to ask the right questions about high drug prices and public policy, focusing on the impact for the patient and the provider. After Gourlay's series on the high price of a blockbuster hepatitis C drug aired in 2014, Rhode Island added several hepatitis C drugs to the state Medicaid formula. Kristen did this project as a National Health Journalism Fellow with our program. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few details. We'll hear first from all our speakers, then we'll open it up to your questions for the final 20 minutes. Because we have several hundred people participating in the webinar, we'll ask you to comment in the question field in your control panel, and we'll read out your questions. If you have technical challenges, please also text us to the question or comment field in your control panel. You can tweet about this webinar at hashtag drug prices, and we will be archiving it afterward on Reporting on Health. Now let's get underway. Molly, tell us what your polls reveal about the public's complex and partisan view of drug pricing. Well, hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, my role really is to just set the stage in terms of how the public is thinking about this issue. Um, I need to start, of course, with a little bit of due diligence. All the data I'm sharing with you today comes from our Kaiser Health Tracking Poll. Um, we conduct a nationally representative, randomly selected, probability-based survey each month by landline and cell phone with about 1,200 adults nationwide. And the margin of um, sampling error on that is about plus or minus three percentage points. And of course, always happy to talk about methods during the Q&A if you're interested. Um, but for now, I wanted to start out by pointing out a few of the conundrums in the public's views on prescription drugs and their prices. Uh, first, we see here that when we ask the public about 16 different potential health policy issues, making sure that the high cost of drugs um, are affordable ranked number one. And it did so even when we looked at responses by people's political party affiliation. Furthermore, you'll note that in the light blue box, that for the public as a whole, government action to lower prescription drug prices ranks second. Even among Republicans, more than half said this was a top priority. Now, I have to say, this came as somewhat of a surprise to us, given that the policy focus of the last you know, handful of years has been so much about the ACA and about repealing it or about improving it or about the implementation of it. So the fact that when we had 16 different items, including many that had to do with the ACA, the fact that the prescription and drug prices and dealing with that popped out to the top really was sort of a striking finding for us. However, on the other hand, when we ask people about how closely they are following various news stories, all the controversies about the high costs of new drugs, like the Solvati case, barely registered with the public. Those news stories aren't breaking through to most Americans. So the priority for action isn't necessarily being driven by the recent media attention to the topic. Now, if you, as you can notice here, more than half of the public takes prescription drugs on a regular basis, making drugs probably the most common touch point for the healthcare system for the widest share of the public. Also note that more than half of those are taking three or more prescription drugs daily. So while it's a common experience, we see here in this slide that most of those that are taking the drugs say that they are at least somewhat easy to afford largely because health insurance protects people against much of the cost of the drugs. Now, you certainly see there that about a quarter of those who are taking drugs say it's difficult to pay or that the cost helps them to not fill or cut 
pills and half are skipped doses. So it's not universally easy to pay, but the majority of the people taking drugs aren't necessarily having trouble themselves paying. And, and you'll note here that when we ask them to think about their own health care cost, just 11% name prescription drug costs as their greatest financial burden. So remember that the public was unified in the priority that they placed on controlling drug prices and wanting government action, but they're not necessarily because they are personally facing the cost problems themselves. And finally, in terms of conundrums, the public generally holds more unfavorable views of the pharmaceutical companies than favorable, but they love and value the products that these companies make. As just one example, note here that most believe that prescription drugs developed over the past 20 years have made the lives of people better. So it really leads me to ask the question, what's going on? It's a top priority for public action, but people aren't necessarily closely following some of the most breaking and, and compelling news stories on the topic. It's a common touchstone in the healthcare domain, but insurance protects many of those against much of the actual costs. And while they dislike this industry, they love the products. Well, I think there's a couple of important underlying factors that can help explain these seemingly somewhat contradictory fi findings. First, even though insurance protects many people against the high costs of some of these drugs, those who are heavy users are, are much more likely to face financial burdens, as you can see here in this chart. Those vulnerable to prices because their health status is fair or poor, or because they have high drug prescription drug needs are much more likely to report financial consequences because of the cost. So it's important to remember that some of the very extreme cost cases that have been the focus of the recent news stories only affect a small share of the public. And also, because it is so common for people to be getting prescription drugs refilled on a monthly basis, people are constantly seeing the prices charged, even if they are only paying their own copay. It's one of the most common experiences across America. You walk into your pharmacy, you pick up your prescription drugs, you see the price charged and the amount you have to pay. It's much more common and happening on a much more regular basis than any other experience in healthcare. So maybe it's not so surprising that we see here that seven in 10 say the costs of prescription drugs are unreasonable. Also, as you see on the right-hand side of this chart, most have also heard a family member or a friend using an anecdote about how they knew somebody who got the same drug a lot cheaper just across the border. Three-quarters of the public, in fact, believes and says that we pay higher prices for the same drugs here than we do across the globe. And perhaps because they see these charges of drugs so regularly, even when they have to just pay a $10, $15, $25, or even a $60 copay, the public believes that it is the prices set by the pharmaceutical companies that's the real problem, not necessarily that the health insurance companies are requiring people to pay too much of the cost. And it's also possible that advertising on TV may be contributing to people's attitudes that companies profit driven. Continually, uh, the public is continually being sold to, just like any other product that they see coming across their um, the TV stations. In fact, in some of the previous work that we've done on the topic, we find that direct-to-consumer drug ads are ubiquitous and that they drive many conversations people are having among their friends, among their family, and certainly with their doctors. So note here in this chart that while the public believes that many things are major factors contributing to the price of prescription drugs, profits of the companies come out on top, with almost 8 in 10 calling it a major factor. And even though the public believes that the products the pharmaceutical companies make are helping people live better lives, they also believe that the companies are more concerned about making profits than about helping people. This is perhaps the reason that we see that they have the unfavorable impressions of the industry and because and that we see that they are willing to see the government or others take action to address the prices. I think this leads us nicely to the last topic I want to touch on briefly, which is if there's really a topic that is catching the public's attention in terms of what they want to see policymakers focus on, what do they want to see done? Well, 
I want to start with um, this one chart, and I know there's too much data on it, but the take-home message is that when we offered five different paths forward, at least seven in ten Americans favored four out of the five options and believed that those four would be effective solutions. So let's just take this pair by pair. 86% favor more price transparency and think that would be effective at controlling drug prices. 83% favored government negotiation with drug companies to get lower prices for medications for people on Medicare and they believe that would be effective. 76% favored price limits for the high cost drugs for illnesses like hepatitis and cancer and believe that would be effective. And 72% favored the importation of um, drugs from Canada and also believe that that would be effective at lowering prices. Lower down um, is making people bear more of the cost of high drugs themselves. The one other point I want to make about this chart is that these, um, these favorability ratings are consistent when we look at Democrats, independents, and Republicans, which is important as we start talking about what could be coming up next. I want to make two quick points. The views on these policy options are not necessarily new. So for at least two of these proposals, they've been on the table for a while, and we have trend data that suggests that similar levels of support back to 2008. And the second thing I want to point out is that we often see this at the beginning of a policy debate. The public says there's a problem and they want to see something done. They tell policymakers, do something, do anything. Um, that's, um, that's the point at the cycle, the policy cycle I think we're in now. There was a famous political scientist um, called Anthony Downs, and he wrote a whole, uh, his whole career in some ways was made famous by his Downs issue attention cycle. And we're at that initial state now, the alarm state, where it's do something, do anything. It's not till the opponents of a policy change start pointing out the traits that we sometimes see shifts in policy p positions among the public. Now, the public does realize there are some nuances in prescribing and does believe that drugs should only be covered by insurance companies if they have been proven more effective than other lower cost existing treatments. That's the data of the pie on the right. But on the other hand, on the left, if a doctor prescribes it, the public says health insurance should have to pay for it. And although above we saw the virtually universal support for specific policy options, we note here that the traditional Republican Democratic differences emerge when you talk in more generic competition versus regulation terms. I put this in as a note about what we can expect in the upcoming primary and general presidential election season. Our data suggests that talking about the high cost of prescription drugs is a good topic for candidates on both sides of the aisle, and that at least for now, as long as the candidate is for doing something about this, then the public will hear what they want to hear. But this chart also suggests that the traditional battle lines between market-based solutions like making people have more skin in the game and government intervention in limiting charges could quickly emerge. So I'm going to stop there for now, and I'll look forward to answering any of your questions after the others um, do their presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Molly. Now that we've heard a little bit about public opinion on this, Dr. Bach, we're going to ask you to share a little bit with us on what we're seeing in the market and what some of the reasons are that are underpinning these developments. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, the, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of high drug prices and what I'd really like to outline today is some of the rationale and arguments that have been put forth by the pharmaceutical and biotech industry and where I think they have merit and where they don't. Uh, the whole thrust of this discussion uh, I think is necessitated by the survey results and other experiences we have seen um, regarding patients and the effect of high prices on them. So there is no question that we are seeing a rise in the price of drugs. I focus on oncology drugs, the largest single sector in the specialty medication space, although not certainly the only one, hepatitis C, hep cholesterol drugs, as others that are uh, rapidly taking market. But uh, we have documented, and a number of others have as well, that over the last 50 years, we just had Medicare's birthday, 
uh, there has been a rise in the price, introductory price of cancer drugs. This graph along the x-axis shows all the years of the Medicare program, the year of cancer drug approval. The y-axis shows the monthly cost of a standardized adult treatment with a new cancer drug. You'll see the rise from $100 to $10,000 over that time period. This is not inflation. We've adjusted for inflation using the Consumer Price Index. So we have a rapid rise in the price of cancer drugs. Please note the y-axis. The only reason you can see this at all is because it's on a log scale. 100-fold price increase. And you could ask a question about this fine. 100 times more expensive, are these drugs 100 times better? And it might be reasonable to say they're at least somewhat better, but here's a graph looking at a fraction, the most recent period of our graph, from 1995 to present day, looking at the benefits of cancer drugs in terms of survival gains in, at, by their time of introduction, same x-axis, but shown on the y-axis this time is not their price, but their price per year of life gained from the drug. And you can see a similar sort of inflation. Every year, the cost for an additional life year goes up in cancer by about $8,500. Again, adjusted for inflation. In 1995, buying a year of life, if I can be so blunt, cost about $50,000. In recent years, 2014, it costs $250,000. Again, adjusted for inflation. This is from a recent NBER working paper we have published. Now, pharmaceutical companies will say, prices are at a level needed to drive innovation. And if we don't have high prices, innovation will slow. And I've argued that actually you can get to the other part of the curve where prices are so high and so readily accessible to any new product that in fact you have innovation going the wrong direction. Now the economic prediction would be that if you could only get high prices if you did something truly innovative and new and different, you would have a strong incentive to take the risks involved. But if you can get high prices, for copycats or Me Too's or chasing already proven pathways, you'll do that instead. So shown on this slide is the market for ALK inhibitors, a rare alteration causing lung cancer and ALK rearrangement, affecting about three to 6,000 new cancer patients per year, I discovered in 2007. And the question is, if prices are very high, you might see a lot of people chasing this narrow market. And in fact, in August of 2011, in April 2014, the first and second line treatments were approved in the ALK space, uh, Pfizer's Alcor and Novartis's Zycadia. Now, the prediction would be if prices are so high that pa patients are chasing an already, or companies are chasing an already occupied space, you'll see a glut in this narrow market. But if prices are only paying for true innovation, people after these companies enter will abandon. This is what we see. These are human trials going on in this narrow space where Pfizer and Novartis already have occupied first and second place. There's also four more drugs in pre-human development. This to me is evidence that prices are frothy even in the copycat space. So if you want to argue that high prices need to drive innovation, that's great, but they probably also need to differentiate between what is innovative and what is not. All right, well then the argument is, well, okay, wait a second. Prices are high but at least they're rational, right? At least they're linked to something. So that's an interesting thought experiment. Shown on this, two, on this slide are two drugs in oncology approved in the same month, February of this year. And they cost about the same, 10,000 bucks a month each. Now you could ask the question, I'm gonna circle back to this, uh, what would constitute uh, evidence of a drug's price making sense? What would be the domains of value? And so consider Faradak versus iBrain. And here are some domains outlined in terms of value that I've assigned uh, normative standards to. Which one's more valuable? A drug on the left that squeaked through the FDA after the oncology advisory panel voted that it not be approved five to two, that's Faradak, or one that gets accelerated approval for impressive results. What about a top population that's targeted. A third line treatment for multiple myeloma with other treatments, that's Faradak, that claims about 11,000 lives a year, or first line metastatic breast cancer treatment, which affects 40, that it claims the lives of 40,000 women each year. Which one's better? One that has a progression-free survival of five months and no overall survival benefit, that's Faradak, or one that has a PFS benefit that's nearly twice as long with emerging survival data. 
which one's better? The one that has severe side effects, so severe that the FDA put a black box on the label for its toxicity, or a drug that's easy to take with moderate side effects? Now, I'm not here promoting Ibrantz or dissing Faradac. They're both probably drugs that constitute progress in oncology, and I'm happy about both of those things. But the question is, if the prices make sense, how can these two drugs have the same price? And then there's another argument. Well, fine, prices are high, but at least the market is working. And I'm looking back at the slides from the earlier presenter. The, the call for market-based solutions versus government solutions should not be considered an either or. It probably should be a both and kind of uh, strategy or thought. But uh, the question I have is, I know what a market's supposed to look like, or at least I took a few classes that told me what it was supposed to look like. Markets should look a certain way. For example, if the company is saying they have to recoup their investment for a drug, as they get larger and larger market share, the prediction would be that if they're pricing to recoup that money, they should lower their price. The other normal feature of a marketplace, and the Republicans would argue the market would work better, is that when competitors enter, the market responds. The, the company that already has place in the market might cut price, take advantage of market share, or try to keep their market share through that. Look at this graph. This is the drug Gleevec. Looking from 2003, when the new formulation was approved, to 2014, this is its inflation-adjusted average cost per day of Gleevec over that time period. So a rise from less than 100 bucks to more than $200 over that time period, again, adjusted for inflation. In 2006, nilotinib, a competitor to Gleevec, was approved. Gleevec's price went up. Multiple indications were approved in 2007 for Gleevec, and the company's drug price went up. The width and breadth and depth of the Gleevec market is vastly exceeds any projections that the company could have possibly had, yet the price keeps going up. That's not about recouping the cost of investment. Desatinib approved in entering 2008 the price went up. No one can look at this graph and say anything about the market is working. Either the competition is working to lower price or that this is about recouping the cost of research and investment. And then another argument that comes up, and this again relates to some of the survey results, the reason why the U.S. pharma is so great is because we pay high prices in the U.S. Now this is a very interesting argument. It's unfamiliar to me that companies argue that because they can garner high prices in one country, they are successful in that country and they are housed in that country. But that is the argument pharma makes. But here's the problem. On this slide, pardon the mislabeling, it's actually the top 12 pharma biotech companies are by revenue in the second column, 2014, pharmaceutical revenue. So for example, j and is a conglomerate, but that's their pharma revenue is $32 billion. Please notice that in gray, these are the home countries of these companies uh, that are ex-U.S. In blue are the, home are the companies located in the U.S. There is no pattern here, if you will. The fact that the U.S. pays the highest prices does not seem to cause pharma companies to locate in the U.S. In fact, half of the companies here are out of the U.S. You can see their sales, and you can also see the percentage of their sales in the far right-hand column that are in the U.S., the only companies that are well north of 50%, in fact, the only company is Gilead, and that probably is an abnormality or a blip due to the hep C treatment. But most of these companies are non-U.S. businesses predominantly, and many of them are not even located in the U.S. So the idea that we are paying high prices to make sure pharma stays at home and generates jobs in the U.S. is not occurring, and certainly wouldn't, no economic theory would predict that that's how it would work anyway. So who suffers from these high prices? Now the survey results pointed out some things. I want to point out in a much more granular way what occurs. And in the survey there was complaints about not only the cost of prescription drugs, but high deductibles, high co-pays, and premiums. I would point out to you that when any of us look at our paychecks, what we are paying for health care appears in many of the lines. Federal taxes supporting the VA and Medicare, a separate Medicare tax, our state taxes supporting state Medicaid programs, our uh, health spending accounts, our health insurance premiums, and the amount we pay out of pocket. Those are all influenced by the cost of prescription drugs, which is a rising uh, component of the health care bill.
But who else suffers? The state Medicaid program is driven near to the brink with Hep C treatment, the VA health system that apparently has bodies they can no longer afford to bury because of the cost of Sovaldi last year, and patients. Shown on this slide is an article by Stacey Dusitsina and her colleagues at the Un University of North Carolina. It showed what basic economic theory would predict but had not been well demonstrated. Uh, this is about, again, the drug Gleevec and its related drugs for the chronic myelogenous leukemia. We are all focused on this because it is one of the most important treatments we have had a approve and arrive on the scene in oncology, originally approved in 2001, turned a rapidly fatal condition into a manageable one. Nothing could be more frustrating for the scientific and biomedical research enterprise to have a drug that is essentially a cure unavailable to patients because of a broken market. But what this slide shows, there's quite a bit of statistics on here, is that for patients who are in plans where they have to pay more out of pocket, the likelihood they don't go to the pharmacy and get their Gleevec rises. And this study was elegant in the sense that it looked at patients over time where their copayment level changed as well as across plan type. So if you ask the question, uh, do the high prices of drugs affect health care and cancer outcomes, this is the sort of evidence. We can connect the dots to this point, non-compliance with Gleevec and other drugs for CML. Once you connect that dot, the next dot to patients dying of a disease that needs to be treated is direct. There's also a study from Washington State from Scott Ramsey and colleagues came out in the middle of 2013 showing the elevated risk of going bankrupt after being diagnosed with cancer. Now, this is not entirely driven by the cost of care. It is, of course, an interaction between the cost of care and the loss of income and other costs that people incur. But part of it is, in fact, driven by that tandem effect. So uh, there's no question that there's a sort of macro level impact of high costs, which include drugs. So where do we go from here? Now, if you will, go, looking back to the earlier survey, there's a sense that we could make the market work better. And there's this basic idea of competition. How could we introduce it? Now, as I showed you on the slide from Gleevec, and we've documented in other places as well, the, introduce, the introduction of competitors does not necessarily achieve price reductions. In fact, it normally doesn't. And in that slide I showed you from the ALK marketplace suggests that people are plunging in to compete with Novartis and Pfizer pretty confident that they're not going to have to have a war with these huge companies on price. And they are absolutely right that at least today in the U.S., they won't have to have a war on price. There's a narrow segment of the healthcare purchasing marketplace that can turn down drugs in their formulary for cancer, but Medicare can't, Medicaid can't, uh, state-regulated insurance plans in most states can't. Uh, in fact, the in Part D plans must include all cancer drugs. You're pretty sure if you get a cancer drug approved, people have to pay the price for it. Employers can exclude cancer drugs. They can use formulary tools. So can PBMs, of course, uh, if they're serving employers. But they do it rarely. Um, there's appetite for it, but it has been slow to get any momentum. We, the doctors in my hospital, uh, said no to one cancer drug in October 14, 2012, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. The drug was Zaltrap, made by Sanofi. When we said no in the New York Times, Sanofi lowered the price of Zaltrap by 50% across the U.S. Uh, it illustrated a couple of things to us. One was that these prices are, in fact, these fragile products of a broken marketplace if the company can simply relaunch at a 50% lower price. But it also illustrated the power of comparative effectiveness research, and that is in fact what we did in that, um, that op-ed, was to describe it in comparison to Avastin. But the last idea is why don't we price based on value? And you could think about value, the value of a drug from a number of perspectives, the benefits and side effects of treatment, what patients should care about and do, the, to academy and in, in academia and industry to promote innovation and risk-taking, support the cost of research, and to society, the goal of targeting rare diseases that we have multiple policies in place to support and also tackling important public health problems. So we launched uh, in June uh, something called the Drug Abacus. It's shown here. It's available at the website shown. This is a value calculator for cancer drugs. It can be used for other drugs. The pilot or the prototype has 54 cancer drugs in it. 
And it includes, in fact, along those six columns in the bottom left, sliders where you can change, or the user or policymakers can change the weight they want to apply to each of these domains, from the dollars per year of life, the amount of drugs should be discounted for toxicity, and other things. And on the abacus above, the gray dots represent today's market prices for these 54 drugs. The red or green dots reflect the drug abacus prices that would be set based on different domains of value. This to me is a way to show that as a proof of principle, we could have value generated prices, we could have a transparent marketplace as well. So I think one of these things is bargaining and saying no or having a value-based price that was set by negotiation through the transparency of data are ways to think about rationalizing this market. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bach. I want to turn now to Kristen Gourlay, a journalist with Rhode Island Public Radio, and ask you what's missing from the conversation on drug pricing? How are we covering this as journalists and thinking about this as policymakers? What can you share with us in that regard? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Gourlay. Um, thanks so much for joining the webinar and uh, for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, as you heard, I'm the healthcare reporter for Rhode Island Public Radio, and I'm going to share with you um, a little bit of what I learned reporting on hepatitis C. Uh, earlier this year, I did a big series on hepatitis C, and a lot of that coverage focused on uh, the high cost of new drugs that have become available and really changed everything for patients with hepatitis C because for the first time, um, some of these new drugs actually offer a reliable cure, but of course, they're incredibly expensive. So. Um, what what uh, we what really struck me about the initial talk about these new drugs, and I'm talking about Savaldi and Harvoni, is um, how much of the coverage the talk was about prices. And for me, that's you, know, you could call it sticker shock, right? Um, specialty drugs, just as you've been hearing from Dr. Bach, um, are often uh, really really expensive drugs. These are drugs for serious or chronic conditions. You can't just walk down to your pharmacy and pick them up. Um, they're a huge driver, as we've been hearing, in uh, the cost of healthcare. The conversation seems to be about uh, the sticker price, and they're high. You know, ninety-four thousand dollars for uh, a course of treatment for Harvoni, for example, and. Um, you know, it really shocks people, for example, when you're talking about treating patients with hepatitis C in particular because this is a disease that still carries a lot of stigma. And, you know, we've seen, I've seen editorials and heard conversations about, um, you know, people really concerned that we're even considering treating prisoners, for example, who have hepatitis C. Um, again, that's a sticker shock. If the costs weren't as high, we probably wouldn't be having that conversation. Um, but what I wanted to look at is what's missing from the conversation uh, when it's all about sticker shock, what is missing from that conversation? Well, for patients, it's really, you know, how much is this drug going to help me? Is it, is it a cure? Does it prolong life? Um, if so, for how long? And, um, you know, will it affect my quality of life? Will it have a lot of side effects? Um, you know, can I afford it? Are there big co-pays? Do I have to take complementary drugs? Not to mention co-insurance. And incidentally for hepatitis C, and I think um, uh, uh, both the previous presenters talked about this, and that is what I have found in my reporting is that co-pays for hepatitis C drugs like Sovaldi and Harvoni are generally pretty low. Some people, have, I've heard reports of up to $3,000 a month but generally, they're pretty low, and some patients have been able to get these drugs uh, at no cost. Um, if they're very low income, they apply uh, for a program through the drug companies. Um, and uh, so that part is not really the problem for patients. Um, you know, what's, uh, what's at issue is, does their insurance cover it? Do they have access to the drug? That's really the bigger issue. What's missing also from this conversation uh, of you know high prices for payers that's you know your health insurer, Medicaid, the VA, prison health systems is 
um, really questions of, you know, is this a very rare disease or is this a big public health burden? In the case of hepatitis C, this is a pretty big health burden. Um, it's, hepatitis C is, is, I believe, the most common blood illness. Between three and five million Americans are infected, and in fact, there's a new wave of infections on the rise because of the growing rates of injection drug use. That is a primary risk factor for um, acquiring hepatitis C. Um, and so the question becomes, can we afford this if so many people are infected with this and could benefit from these drugs? And the answer to that right now with current prices is even if we wanted to treat everyone in the, in the United States who is chronically infected with hepatitis C, we couldn't. We couldn't afford it. We would have to, for example, not treat cancer or not treat uh, diabetes or something, something else. It, the cost is just too astronomical. Um, and, you know, is the old treatment just as good? Could we fall back on that? Well, in this case, for hepatitis C, the answer is no, not really. The old treatment was something called uh, interferon in combination with uh, some other drugs. It worked less than half the time uh, in terms of curing people. You have to take it for a long time. It's very complicated, and the side effects are uh, horrible. And in fact, some people just couldn't even tolerate it uh, for several reasons. So it's, it's not a great option. The new drugs are quickly becoming the standard of care, and that gets to the next question, do we have to offer this treatment um, you know, from a payer's perspective? The answer is increasingly yes, because these drugs are, are becoming the standard of care. One way to get beyond this sticker shock uh, conversation is to ask, is a drug cost effective? Um, Dr. Bach talked about this in, in a much more sophisticated way than I'm going to, um, but here's Here's what I learned and how I decided to approach some of my reporting. Um, to ask whether a drug is cost effective, it can might be a little bit uncomfortable for some people. You know, it's uncomfortable to think about how much you're going to pay for something that might cure you or save your life, especially if, if it's your health or your child's health or your patient's. You know, we want to treat people, we want to alleviate pain, uh, we want to save lives no matter the cost. But in a system with resource constraints, and um, you know that can be any kind of healthcare system you're talking about. You know, think in particular of Medicaid systems. You know, this really has to be a part of the conversation, and it's certainly a part of the conversation in other countries, many other countries. Think of the the uh, United Kingdom, for example, and uh, they have an entire you know panel and advisory board that looks at the cost effectiveness of new treatments before approving them. Um, so there's actually an equation for this, and um, to work it out, you have to understand this concept of the quality-adjusted life year, which sounds really wonky, but basically it's, it's a term health economists have come up with um, that combines survival with uh, quality of life. Um, and I'm going to venture into some territories where uh, a lot of journalists fear to tread, myself included. It's math. Um, I, I'm terrible at math, but I spent some time with health economists and um, with a couple of them and got them to really walk me through this so I could understand it. And, and I think it gives some really helpful um, context. Uh, it's good information to have in your back pocket as a journalist to help you um, and perhaps help your readers or listeners cut through the hysteria about drug prices. Um, cost effectiveness is basically, you know, how much bang are you getting for your buck? So, um, for new hepatitis C treatments, which, you know, vary based on how long you have to take them or what genotype or what particular flavor of hepatitis C you have, um, the newer ones are generally, by the way, considered cost effective for patients with certain types of hepatitis C. Um, and something that's cost effective generally buys one quality adjusted life year for less than $50,000. Now, where do we come up with this $50,000 number? Well, um, a health economist explained to me that it's about what a healthy person could potentially be expected to produce in terms of economic value a year. It's just kind of this generally agreed upon number. So the equation goes like this. It's the price of the new treatment divided by the price of the old treatment 
uh, oh, that's the top of the equation. The bottom of the equation is the number of quality adjusted life years gained with the new treatment minus the quality adjusted life years gained with the old treatment. And what we come up with is a dollar value. So um, this may just do your head in if you're just looking at it for the first time. And I thought when I was doing my hepatitis C series that I'd have a little fun with it. And so I'll just give you a little flavor with of um, just an excerpt from a piece I did as part of the series called um, The Uncomfortable Math of Hepatitis C. And what you're going to hear is um, just part of part of a session where I sat down with a health economist and I actually at Tufts University, Dr. John Wong, um, and I had him kind of sketch this out for me on the literally on the back of my nap, of my uh, notebook. And then um, I sort of um, did this kind of back and forth with a producer, with a, a morning producer in our newsroom to kind of walk him through the math as a way of, of you know, having a little bit of fun and sort of walking through this concept. And I'll just give you a little taste right now. Yeah. This out. Okay, so. so this is new minus standard. So right here is just jotting down the cost of Savalvi, $84,000, minus the cost of standard care. That's a drug called interferon in this case, which costs about $30,000. Okay, so $84,000 minus $30,000. That's $54,000. Great. Okay. Now, he's drawing a line under those numbers, and underneath that, he's writing how much better is the new treatment minus the old this treatment. This is new minus better. Better is a feeling, not a number. How do you measure that? That's where this idea comes in, the quality adjusted life year. Oh, my head hurts. I know. Hold on, though. I've got someone else who can explain this really, really well. My name is James David Chambers. I'm an assistant professor at Tufts Medical Center. He's a colleague of Dr. Wong's, actually. Chambers says a quality-adjusted life year helps health economists like him compare one treatment to another regardless of what that treatment is for. And how it does that is that it combines two different aspects of health. It combines survival with quality of life. And it combines those two aspects of health into a single health metric. So it's not only how much longer will this treatment help live, but also what kind of quality of life will it get you? All right, so back to the equation. All right, so that just gives you a little flavor of one way I approached it. I, I covered the cost of these drugs and cost effectiveness questions and access and affordability in a bunch of different stories and that's on the you can find those on the uh, reporting on health.org website um, if you are interested but that gives you just a little flavor and I'm gonna wrap up pretty soon here but I'll just say um, another way and some other questions I think we should ask that get beyond price and cost effectiveness include these and, and I think when it comes to hepatitis C drugs in particular access is really the big issue right now are insurers and other payers restricting access to this treatment? Um, in the case of hepatitis C, indeed they are. Um, Medicaid agencies across the country, for example, um, have adopted a, a huge variety of different policies about who gets these treatments. And you know, you can understand from their point of view why there, there are some restrictions on these. And that's because, as I mentioned before, if we were to treat everyone, whether it's the entire Medicaid population uh, that uh, has a diagnosis of chronic hepatitis C or what have you, um, it would bank the system. So they're trying to figure out a way to, um, to uh, get these drugs to people who need them uh, without bankrupting the system. One way they're, but uh, the question is, you know, are they doing it in a way that you know, that makes sense for people, I'll, I'll leave those questions aside for now. But for example, uh, many states uh, require a pre-authorization, that's a form a doctor fills out with a patient requesting treatment, and some of them are quite restrictive. Um, in Rhode Island, for example, you have to be, you basically have to be so sick with hepatitis C uh, before you qualify to get the drug. You have to have a uh, it's called a fibrosis score, basically of three or above. That's when uh, that's the, the, that's a cirrhotic liver, um, a liver with a lot of scarring. Um, if you are incarcerated, 
it's a totally different story. There is uh, a law that says prisons must use the, um, the community accepted standard of care for prisoners. You know, whatever you and I outside the walls of a prison would um, receive in terms of health care, prisoners are to be offered the same. And yet, prison health care budgets are constrained. The entire health care budget for the prison system in tiny little Rhode Island is uh, $20 million. Treating all of the prisoners who are estimated in that system to have hepatitis C would completely blow the entire health care budget. So they basically formed a committee, and they're evaluating patients on a case-by-case -case basis and triaging who gets the drugs. Um, insurers have different formularies uh, and different uh, level, different um, uh, uh, policies for who they'll approve for getting these drugs. This is an interesting thing to think about, this idea of access when you think about cost effectiveness because on the one hand you could say treating these drugs are cost effective, they cure hepatitis C and they will prevent a lot of downstream costs associated with cirrhosis liver cancer, et cetera, um, and that treating people, for example, in prison is cost effective because you reduce a, a large uh, reservoir of hepatitis C. You could eliminate, if you could eliminate it in prisons, you could um, make a big dent in stopping the spread elsewhere. Um, but, you know, our system isn't really set up to uh, think big picture when it comes to fighting big public health challenges like that. Um, you can also ask, is this treatment affordable? A treatment might be cost effective, but just as I've been saying, you know, can the health system afford it? And right now, with the prices the way they are, the answer is no. So um, you can find plenty of patients, if you want to report on this, who will tell you about their experiences. I had luck finding patients. Um, talking to people associated with the prison, with community health clinics, talking to specialists in gastroenterology, um, and much, much more. Oh, and also talking to people in the addiction treatment field, um, uh, people involved with methadone clinics, those kinds of things. But, um, you know, people uh, were very willing to share their stories with me, which I was very grateful for, and um, that's how I tried to humanize it. So. I've got resources listed here for people who are interested. I'll, we'll post them along with the recording of this presentation. And I just want to thank you so much for uh, participating and letting me share my work with you. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you so much, Kristen. I have a quick question for you before we open up uh, to some of the questions from participants. And that is um, sort of implicit in your remarks is this idea that this story is not just a big national and international story about policy, that it's really a local story with a host of decisions that are made on a state level, on prison level, even individual hospital level. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about just what the possibilities are for reporters who are thinking about this as too big to take on because they're in a local market. Absolutely. Well, you can start by, um, you know, getting some data on, you know, with the burden of hepatitis C in your area. And one good way to do that is to go to your state Medicaid agency. Um, they will have, um, you know, they can look up diagnosis codes, basically, and they should be able to give you an estimate of the number of people with a diagnosis of chronic hepatitis C. Of course, that's just a part of the picture because most people who have hepatitis C don't know it. Um, you could ask them to share their policies with you, their policies for co um, covering these drugs, providing access to them, ask for a copy of their pre-authorization form, um, talk to doctors, talk to local doctors, you know, talk to folks in local gastroenterology departments and find out what their experience is getting access to these drugs and, um, you know, the kinds of, of of patients and issues that they're seeing. So there are a lot of ways uh, to localize this. The other thing to think about is um, the public health aspect and the fact that we've got more uh, IV drug injection drug users right now it means that this um, that hepatitis C is is emerging again. There's a new wave of infections, and you might look at you know how local agencies, nonprofits, your state approaches. Um, 
you know, curbing injection drug use, making uh, available, you know, needle exchanges, those kinds of things. So there are lots of ways to localize this story. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question for Dr. Bach from Mark Smith, Managing Editor of the Center for Health Reporting. He asked really the, the big question, which is what will it take to get drug makers together with health plans to come up with more rational pricing protocols for specialty drugs, perhaps based on long-term value? Do we need government intervention uh, to address this? Dr. Bach, you're muted, I think, so if you're, you might want to unmute your uh, phone to reply. Oh, can you hear me now? <clears throat> Is that better? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, good. All right, all right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, all right. Let me address that question about uh, pharma and payers coming together in a second. But on the Hep C space, let me let me try and amplify a few of Kristen's points. Uh, one is the cost effectiveness threshold that Kristen cited, the fifty thousand dollars per quality. Please remember that on my slides in oncology, we're at about two hundred and fifty thousand per quality. And although it is a sort of an academic notion that fifty thousand per quality, and it sort of maps to the United Kingdom system is something that's, quote, accepted. It bears no relation to what we actually pay for healthcare in the U.S. So it is a sort of a, a high water mark that's actually well beneath the surface of the water at this point. Um, on the hep C side, it is interesting to ask the question, as Kristen noted, hep C is a, is a disease to a large extent today of behavior. It uh, is transmitted sexually. It's transmitted through uh, needle sharing. Uh, in other words, it is a communicable disease. Uh, when people talk about the hep C treatments curing condition, they always leave out the fact that people regularly get reinfected. Uh, but if you took a public health view of the disease, the drug would be priced wildly differently and policies would be wildly different. Um, the best way is to try and achieve sort of herd effect by widely treating the infection to decrease the person-to-person -person transmission of it. We have taken the opposite approach. Uh, I'm not crediting or blaming insurers per se, but they have done it largely to protect their net, their closed budgets. Uh, but it is the least effective way of reducing the transmission of the disease to only treat people who are end stage. Uh, it does serve the goals of the company to narrowly bleed out the drug at a very high cost so that the disease remains widely prevalent. Uh, so it's I think it's an important thing to ask what goals are being served. Uh, on the pharma payer side, I, th I resist the notion of lumping either the drug industry or the insurance industry into one bucket. Uh, there are both innovative payers and their pharmaceutical companies that are thinking into the future knowing that this system is completely broken. The CEO of Novartis has said multiple times in public as the world's largest drug company that this system of pricing is broken, will not work for the long-term sustainability of their very old company. And so I think some of these companies would like a value-based system. They are hindered uh, through some regulatory apparatus that I think can be addressed from doing things like charging differentially for the same drug based on indication, something everyone acknowledges we need to be able to do. Uh, they're hindered by the awkward insurer tools, and insurers have limited flexibility sometimes in terms of changing copayment rates. And as everyone knows, the exchange plan, those coinsurance rates baked in. So. I think there is a way forward. We'll see it from a few plans. We'll see it from a few insurers. And if those models work, we may not need government regulation to get there, or maybe government will help us spur it along once they see effective pots. But I, I don't see government leading the way on this, uh, changing the payment system approach. Thank you, Dr. Bach. An another question from Maribeth Healy. What percentage of premiums are attributable to Rx prices and costs? Uh, you know, in, in broad strokes, the spend on drugs, uh, pharma will often say it's 10%. They're focusing just on the prescription drugs. There's a whole bunch of drugs in the medical benefit as well, which are a little bit harder to see. We're probably at about 12%. We're probably heading to about 15 to 17%. The coinsurance and deductibles vary by plan type, but I think as a walking around term, it is that minority that's on drugs. But it is the most rapidly rising sector of healthcare spending as well. And we have two uh, kind of related questions. Uh, one uh, that I'll combine, one from Chris Brown and from Emily Bazar. Uh, Chris asks uh, and remarks, Robert uh, Zirkelbach 
of uh, pharma has cited the high cost of developing new cutting-edge drugs as a huge part of the high cost of existing meds. I've heard others say those numbers are inflated since a huge percentage of new drugs are either reformulations of existing meds or else piggyback on earlier research. Can you talk a bit about the cost of developing drugs and how that plays into the market cost? And then the related question from Emily is, can someone please address the rising cost of generic drugs? Do you want me to take that one? Why don't you get us started, and then uh, other folks can chime in as well. Okay. Um, so uh, let me take it in reverse order. The rising cost of generic drugs is sort of uh, a perfect proof of the fact that there's unconstrained pricing power. There is no innovation involved with companies through financial techniques, you know, walling off the market for generics and essentially becoming sole source providers, being able to raise the price that is purely taking advantage of a broken system. If I were an investor in one of these funds, I guess I'd be a very happy camper. Uh, but these are financial instruments being created around drugs. So there's nothing benefit. This is just harm to patients in the system. It is essentially a wealth transfer from insurance programs and state-funded programs to the funds and their investors. Uh, but on the other side, uh, let me back up on this question of the cost of R&D. Uh, there aren't good data on it. We can certainly map some drugs and their entire histories and you know, wildly debunk these claims of multiple billions of dollars. Uh, you know, and there's, there's examples where companies, you, know, you can trace their whole funding history and you don't get close to the numbers. But I actually would ask a different question. When the pharmaceutical industry makes the claim that their high prices are about recouping the cost of investment, they're actually using the language of regulated monopolies. So if you look at, for example, power companies, they are regulated monopolies. We give them isolated power lines. We give them regions, and we regulate their profits. They have to open their books. And they are, if you will, an entire world of boringness, as is described in The New Yorker, of businesses. They don't seek to grow. They don't seek to do anything innovative. They essentially just generate their profits. But the important thing about that is that's the trade they have made. They get their profits. We op they open their books and they can't make excessive profits. And they, in for exchange of that, they get patent protection. Now, when pharma says it costs that much to develop a new drug, they are using the same language. And the question I would have back to them is, do they want their profits regulated? Because if not, then they're an entrepreneurial business and the cost of research and development is irrelevant just like it is at Apple. So it's a sort of which one is it kind of question. And if it's just we, you know, it costs us a lot to do research and development, so we're going to charge our high prices. I would ask the follow-on question, well, how do we know you're charging the right amount as opposed to too much without us knowing the cost of R&D directly? And five or six states now have legislation in place to try and open up those kind of questions. This is Kristen. Can I just jump in really quickly and say, as a reporter, this is one of the most frustrating things about covering the high cost of drugs, and that is because there's very little transparency around how uh, uh, pharma companies arrive at their high prices. They won't disclose that, but even more, um, they don't disclose the uh, amount of the discounts they offer a lot of different payers and providers. For example, Medicaid agencies typically get some kind of a discount, and some of them may have been able to negotiate a discount, but no one will disclose that. Also, um, there, oh, and by the way, Medicare, with that we haven't even mentioned, isn't even allowed by federal law to negotiate drug prices. So there may be some wiggle room on these prices, but there's very little transparency in how that's done, how much, and uh, how the drug companies have even arrived at their sticker prices in the first place. And this is Molly. I just wanted to add quickly on this point that, um, you know, when we saw the poll results, we were we asked people about this very thing, this price transparency. And while I wasn't so surprised that people favor it, people are kind of always in favor of more transparency, more information. They love that idea. I was more surprised that they really thought it would be effective. So the idea that it would be effective to, like, get this information out there, that would actually change behavior and it would lower prices, and I found that to be interesting in our results. Thank you very much. We have a question from Michael Stinson. He asks, 
what needs to happen to get physicians and payers on the same page to address the prescribing of overpriced drugs that show no reasonable clinical benefit? Anybody want to tackle that one? Yeah, can you re-ask re it? Yes, what needs to happen to get physicians and payers on the same page to address the prescribing of overpriced drugs that show no reasonable clinical benefit? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, let me take a crack at it, but I'm pausing because I, uh, I, it's common to suggest that drugs that have small amounts of benefit can be rounded down to zero. Uh, and as a doc, um, I find that one tough. Um, there are some drugs that the toxicities outweigh the benefits, um, and I think that one's an easier calculus, but it, it's not uncommon to see stories written about, I don't know, uh, Tarceva and pancreatic cancer and only gives a few weeks of life and it costs X number of thousands of dollars, and, you know, and, and that's sort of it's called waste. But, you know, the... The challenge is, and if you look at the drug abacus, you ask this question about value. Um, the problem is the mismatch between the magnitude of the benefit. I'm not a, in favor of rounding down to zero when the answer isn't zero. Um, what I'm in favor of is trying to match the price so that the value equation all makes sense. I think we probably all think paying 50 cents for a drug that makes you live two days longer and has no toxicity makes sense and paying for a million dollars for it doesn't. So the idea of the drug abacus or any value-based approach is to try and reconcile those things as opposed to trying to get doctors to um, not use things that are only marginally effective because of the high cost. And I do want, you know, another story here is that by pushing the payment decisions down to the level of ACOs and bundles and encouraging people to save money, those sorts of rounding down decisions will get made in a way that is not widely visible to the public or widely visible to researchers for scrutiny. And I think that is actually a concern. So I may rail against the high prices of drugs, but I'm not going to rail against their minimal benefits because I know the science is hard. And so what I would like is the two things to line up. And um, we're a little over now. I'm just going to go for a few more minutes. But um, Dr. Bach, a question from uh, Jane DuBose. She asks, are any pharma manufacturers working with you on the drug abacus, or has the reaction been what we might predict? Uh, well, I don't know what you would predict, but uh, you know, I have a number of uh, relationships both with payers and pharma that are informal. I do my own research, but I'd love to hear input uh, from anyone in the sector. My theory is that, and there's been mention of it on this call, that these negotiations occur between pharma that wants to maximize revenues and payers that want to maximize their rebates and nobody gets to see those discussions and my idea is that the drug abacus or any approach driven by value is sort of the third person sitting at that negotiating table what's a fair price and the trade should be the drug companies should be able willing to sell products at a fair price so those with highly successful agents should garner more than those with uh, poor agents, but payers should be willing to let that fair price travel through with minimal or no coinsurance and maybe trivial copayments. Because if it has a value-based price, it should get to patients. We shouldn't have what we have with Gleevec today. And do you think that there might be a role for government uh, to insist on some sort of uh, transparency in reporting on drug prices so that your abacus and other measurement tools um, could be more reflective of, of what's happening? Yeah, I think that uh, I think the most important stuff is really getting to understand what we know about the agents clinically in terms of com their effectiveness, comparative effectiveness, subgroups. We should have as much access to data as we can possibly have. I, like I, my earlier comments suggested, I don't even think the pharma industry actually cares about the cost of R&D in terms of pricing. That's just a talking point. No pharma exec will tell you they want their profits to be guaranteed at a certain margin. But we should have as much data as possible about drugs and we should have access which we are increasingly getting and many pharma companies are being uh, adventurous about sharing their 
uh, preclinical and clinical data. And then we should have more follow-ups and registries and health insurance, all this stuff that dreams of EHR so we could reconcile prices going forward. Uh, all that stuff could happen and actually would serve the long-term interests of pharma and patients. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can I, if Molly, I just want to add one um, other dimension of this, particularly for the reporters who are out talking to, you know, people is, you know, we're talking about something that's very emotional. We're talking about the health and well-being of people's loved ones. And when there's any possibility or there's something, I mean, these conversations between patients and doctors are very tough. And in a lot of the research that we've done, we found that you know, doctors, despite all the data out there, whatever they have, they're sitting there with patients who have heard about something or think there might be something available that might, you know, help, might help alleviate the pain and suffering of their loved ones. And so I just, so, you know, as, as important as it is to be talking about the economics and the qualities and all that part, the other part of this is a very human story that's playing out, you know, in doctors, you know, offices and hospitals and in people's bedrooms and kitchen tables all over the country. And that's what we see in our polling results. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to let you all know um, Dr. Bach was able to stay another five minutes, but he has to duck out now. And our other two panelists can stay for about another five minutes more. Um, we'll be also sending you a quick survey to ask you for your feedback on this, which we would appreciate if you could fill out. And if you're a journalist or even a policy person who is using this webinar in some way, please write us and let us know at editor at reporting on health.org. So we have a question from Rebecca Thorsness. And um, I don't know, Kristen, if you want to tackle this one. She says, how can prisons and insurance programs, both public and, and private, work together to ensure treatment, especially for hepatitis C, isn't wasted as an individual moves in and out of the criminal justice system? If we start treating someone in prison, we should finish it after their release so the treatment isn't wasted and vice versa. I don't know if this came up in Rhode Island as, as these issues were debated. Absolutely. This is a really big issue. Um, from the big picture question is who ultimately has the responsibility for, you know, initiating treatment? Um, you know, should prisons take on that responsibility? Should the outside health systems take on that responsibility? With the older drugs for hepatitis C, um, this was a much bigger issue because treatment took a really long time. It could take a year or more. And so if someone was only going to be in the system for a while, sometimes, you know, the health uh, healthcare um, director in the prison system would say, well, uh, we're just not going to have this person long enough. He or she is not a good candidate for starting treatment. Um, with the newer drugs, um, that isn't as much of an issue. You can, some people are cured in as little as six weeks, 12 weeks. You know, for some people it's taking a bit longer, uh, depending on how sick they are already. Um, but, you know, you can effectively cure someone pretty quickly. Um, and if they're only going to, be going to be behind bars for six months or something, you still have enough time basically to get someone treated. The issue then is connecting them with care on the outside. And that's an issue that a lot of prison systems struggle with. It's certainly an issue here in Rhode Island. Um, and there are, you know, uh, social workers and others who try to um, do some discharge planning with inmates and get them, make sure that they're connected to care on the outside. With hepatitis C, the issue is making sure that if someone was um, an, an, uh, an injection drug user and has struggled with addiction in the past to make sure that um, he or she stays you know, gets into treatment, stays in treatment. Dr. Bach mentioned that the, one, a big issue with hepatitis C is that a lot of people get reinfected. I'm, I'm not sure that's actually that true. It's definitely possible, um, but it's certainly not a reason to uh, restrict treatment or, you know, deny treatment for people because uh, they might be going back to injection drug use. In fact, um, some of the researchers I've spoken to say that um, you know, once someone, you know, even if someone is still using injection drugs, it's a good idea to treat them because then they won't be able to pass the disease along. And if they can be taught safe injection practices, then, you know, you can have a pretty good rate of success. But it is a huge issue, less so now because the new drugs uh, just don't take as long and you can, you can cure someone uh, who's behind bars. 
Thank you. Our final question is from Terry Sukai. And I don't know, Molly, if you want to tackle it, what impact does public advertising have on the cost of medications? Commercials, magazine ads, billboards must have a tremendous financial impact, and these monies could be used in other more beneficial ways. Um, you know, it's been a long time since I looked at the actual economics of that. What I, what I do know is from the work that we did on talking to um, the public and to doctors about this issue, is that doctors often felt like they're put in a bind by the patients coming in with um, a particular drug in mind because of an ad. Now what the doctors also say is it gives them an opportunity to, to discuss other treatment options with patients. And what we know from our research is that generally um, about a third of people who've seen an ad have walked into a doctor's office to talk about a particular drug. At that point, a conversation ensues and most of those people, something happens, it doesn't necessarily mean they get prescribed that drug that they walked in asking for. Um, so there's certainly um, a, a sense that it is, the advertising is doing what it's designed to do, which is to get people talking and get conversations happening. Um, the products are different than, say, an ad for any other consumer product, like um, McDonald's or um, a Starbucks ad where you can just go out and purchase whatever you want based on what you choose after you've seen the ad. In this case, you have to go to that gatekeeper, to the doctor. So you really have this, this situation where it promotes conversations, but you don't know, um, it doesn't necessarily always promote um, a prescription for that particular drug. Thank you so much, Molly, and thank you, Kristen and Dr. Bach, and I want to thank all of the folks who participated in this webinar for your excellent questions and your participation. As I mentioned, we'll be sending you a quick survey, and we urge you to complete it. Also, if um, this webinar informs your work in some way, please let us know. Send us stories you write at editor at reportingonhealth.org, and uh, let us know what webinars you'd like to see next. That's one of our survey questions. Thank you so much. We're going to end our webinar now.